Hello and welcome to Ageless Rock, a channel for megalithic fans with megalithic lens. Cambodia has so many megalithic monuments, you will be forgiven to think that there was once a giant race who lived there in our distant past. Cambodians not only have West Beret but also East Beret to blow your mind. I am very convinced that something big happened on this part of the planet, not just historically but also physically. The number of megalithic temples and berets and moats just don't make sense. It exceeded the need of local population many times over even if they can do it. Although we know next to nothing about East Beret and East Mebon, credit is given to Yasovarman I, who is also known as the Leper King, who ruled from 889 to 910 AD. But we do know a vast area of Cambodia has rainwater that flows into Tonle Sap Lake. There is so much water for six months of the year that the last thing you want is a reservoir next to it. Every year, Cambodians who live around Tonle Sap Lake welcome the monsoon rain because when the water swells nine times the volume, the fishing industry comes to life. At around November, water starts to flow towards South China Sea. The berets are not very helpful as they too are drying up. You can see from the altitude on Google Earth that East Beret will actually help to fill up water and seal into West Beret during torrential rain of a monsoon season. As water recedes, farmers rejoice on the flat land busy planting rice on flooded land provided by Mother Nature. There is little need for reservoir. As you can see here, Mother Nature already provided a good deal of water in the green area. In fact, they rely on this wet green zone more than the two berets combined, without lifting a finger as far as water for agriculture is concerned. If East Beret was ever a reservoir, you don't have to guess where are the water channels based on the altitude from Google Earth. The drainage system should be on the south wall of the beret, flowing south based on topography logic. But why would ancient Cambodians need East Beret when Mother Nature already provided a natural water tank? If ancient Cambodians are obsessed with digging drains, all they need is tap into the natural water source. East Beret is only slightly smaller than West Beret in terms of area size. No matter how I measure on Google Map, it is approximately 7.3 km long and 1.85 km wide. Based on my measurement, the area is approximately 13.5 square kilometers. The reason I am more confident with my measurements is that, according to Wikipedia, the larger West Beret contains 53 million cubic meters of water, while East Beret, which is slightly smaller, but contains 55 million cubic meters of water. That could only mean East Beret is significantly deeper. To add to the confusion, the given depth of 4 meters for West Beret will mean a volume of approximately 66 million cubic meters. So, as you can see, the official version is rather confusing to me. According to Maurice Gray's in his book, The Monuments of the Angkor Group, the depth of East Beret is 3 meters and holds 40.5 million cubic meters of water. Did ancient Cambodians actually dig a water tank to hold 106.5 million cubic meters of water? Is that even insanely possible with just holes and shovels with baskets and wheelbarrows? Am I supposed to assume that Angkorians were so busy digging, they had no time to write and therefore nothing was written, and that is why we know nothing today? Just like West Beret and West Mebon, East Beret and East Mebon is a colossal water tank with a temple in the middle. 
I presented my idea in my previous video of this superstructure is a mode with a temple, just like Angkor Wat, Angkor Thom, and many more all over Cambodia. It is not hard to see that this is a mode if you compare the designs based on the concept of a temple in brown, on a piece of land in green, surrounded by water in blue. When something is disproportionate to the norm, then it is harder to see they are actually the same, just like a penguin is actually a bird. Today, the perimeter can only be seen from an aerial view. The locals living within the beret has no interest in the magnificence of this ancient structure. The natives here are simple and unsophisticated, with no interest in reservoir and astronomy. They are a bunch of hospitable and happy people. At ground level, it is business as usual. Life goes on as if there never was a reservoir. No one will be digging for water tank because they will have too much water for 6 months of a year, every year. They never build reservoir without water channels on lower ground next to a lake. Whether this is a moat or a water tank, it will be impossible to keep up with the amount of silt to remove after a rainy season. But why would you want to do that if the most logical thing to do is to plant rice as soon as water level allows you to do so? As you enter through the beret to go to the temple, you will come to face the temple wall on the east side. This square temple is a Hindu temple measuring approximately 120 meters on all sides. You will be greeted by a wall of laterite stones. This temple is mostly laterite stones for walls and platforms. The five pyramidal temples on top of the platform is a mixture of sandstone and laterite. I cannot imagine the task of excavating this beret where it will take a lot of effort to dig for 6 months, but heavy rain will try to bury it for 6 months. Right on the first level of the temple platform, you can imagine how awesome it would have been if the entire surrounding is rainwater enough to make you think it is a sea. Imagine upon completion, the top of the majestic temple overlooking the beret must have been a breathtaking view. Most articles will describe this as a pyramidal roof temple. If the roof was meant to represent something, it would be a lotus bud. For now, Rajendra Varman II gets the credit for constructing East Mabon. I wonder what inspired him to have a Queen Kang's formation at the center of the temple. It is common to read that it represents Mount Meru surrounded by four smaller temples, which is a typical Hindu cosmology concept. Queen Kang's formation is more than just a coincidence. Stone formation at Rapa Nui Island, Hodota Kofun in Japan, and Crop Circle in England will probably make you think twice about the significance of this formation. They all have one thing in common. We have no idea why. The main feature of the East Mabon is the five towers with the center tower being the largest and tallest. They are all facing east with false doors on the side. The original name, Yasho Tataka, is still being used by the locals today. East Mabon is a Hindu temple for Shiva. Although it is a slightly smaller parade, the temple is very much bigger and still impressive. I am still puzzled why a slightly smaller parade gets a much bigger temple. East Mabon is a Hindu temple for Shiva. You can see four yonis but without lingas. The sanctum is now a Buddhist shrine. As you can see here, Buddhist tourists, both locals and foreign, still pay their respect when they visit this site. This temple is also famous for its large elephant statues on several corners of the platform. Some say elephants were used to build the berets and carry stones, but that will mean a lot of logistics and will raise other questions. 
Raising and training the elephants by tens of thousands over a century is never documented as part of Cambodia's history. How do you take care of their breakfast, lunch and dinner anyway? Well, that's all for today. Hope you enjoy my short presentation on East Beret and Mabon and have a wonderful day. This is Bernie Ong signing out. Lay high.